Good evening, everyone. And uh, if you give me a thumbs up, if you can see the uh, the slide in front of you. That's great. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, Bible talk. As you can see, the title is uh, Good News. It's the end of the world. And uh, all we're going to do tonight is look at the word of God and see what it has to tell us about what's going on in the world and where the world is going. It's uh, a message which has been recorded uh, for a very long time and uh, there's only a, a few people in the world that really read it and study it and understand it but uh, a lot of people in the world right now are very concerned about the things that have happened particularly this year of course with the uh, the global uh, pandemic of COVID-19 but not only that the impact it's having on our way of life in this country and uh, lots of other countries around the world as well. What impact is it going to have on the economy? What's it going to have on healthcare? What's it going to have in just about every aspect of uh, daily life? Things have changed possibly permanently in many ways this year. However, um, I want this talk tonight to be um, all about the good news that the Bible message contains for us. I want this to be a, a positive talk. And once we've gone through some of the scriptures where God has spoken about what he's doing with the world and the way in which he wants it to go and the way in which he is in the process at the moment and has been eternally for setting up a global kingdom of peace and righteousness on the earth. Once we understand a little of that message, I think we'll be a little more comforted that the world is actually going in a good direction in the long term. Trying to move my slide on and it doesn't seem to want to do it. Don't know why that is. Give me a second. Sorry about the technicals. Ah, there we are. Seems to be working now. Sorry about that. Okay. So I want to um, go into the Old Testament first and look at a couple of verses just to set the tone. As I've said, I, I just want this to be a um, uh, a positive good news Bible talk tonight. Now, there's a prophecy recorded by uh, God's prophet Isaiah. And in uh, chapter nine, he says this. Now, these words here, which Isaiah recorded thousands of years ago, um, haven't come to fulfillment in full yet. However, they will do. So let's just see what this picture is that the Lord God is revealing to us through the words of this prophecy in Isaiah. What does it say? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, we live in a world today whereby the world isn't governed by one government over the whole of the territories of the earth. We have lots of different governments of lots of different shapes and sizes and ideologies governing different bits of territory, don't we? But God is saying here through the prophet Isaiah that there is a time coming in the future where there will be one government over the whole of the earth. And that government's responsibility will rest on the shoulders of one individual, a child who is to be born, a son who is to be given. This is a reference here to God's son, the Lord Jesus Christ who is going to be called Wonderful, um, the Prince of Peace. He is going to inherit a kingdom. And if we look into our scriptures, we find out that the Lord Jesus Christ, in his lineage, is descended from the ancient king, King David of Israel. So he is the rightful heir to the throne in that you know, standard lineage kind of sense. But this kingdom, which will be established, as Isaiah 9 says, will be established forever. All human kingdoms throughout history have risen and then fallen because one king has taken over the territory of another, there's been battles, there's been empires, they've come and gone. Territories that men have created and kingdoms that men have built have been taken over at times by other men's kingdoms. 
and uh, the map has been redrawn many, many times, hasn't it? But this kingdom, which is going to be set up when uh, the Lord God sets up this kingdom with Jesus Christ as the king of the world, will be different and unique and the first of its kind. And notice those last few verses, uh, those last few words there in, in verse 7 of uh, Isaiah 9. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So whenever you see the phrase, the Lord of hosts, that can be translated better as God of armies. This is almighty God using force to enable his will to be performed. So when God chooses to use his force to bring things to bear, they will actually happen. So another prophecy we have in Isaiah in chapter 11 has these words recorded for us. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither approve after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with a rod of iron, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf shall also dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. <clears throat> so you can picture the images conjured up by those verses, again from Isaiah, in your mind. A time in the future where uh, this one individual who'll come from the, the stem of Jesse, the, the, the family of uh, King David, Jesse was his father, um, this descendant will come and will rule over the earth and will ensure that righteousness is throughout the whole world. We notice there how the natural world, animals, will interact with each other very differently in that time. Uh, and we can see how the whole world, as it says in verse nine, will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So we live in a world at the moment where there is a little bit of knowledge from some people, an understanding of what God has said will he will do in the world, but most people follow their own ideas, don't they? And uh, that's why the world has the many problems which it does have. That will end when God sets up this global kingdom. So then, uh, our talk tonight, let's look at the good news. Uh, let's then consider where we are at the moment, uh, the news of the world, if you like. Uh, and then just to end, I want to again uh, stress that this is something to be uh, a, a good news talk. Let's look at the good news again at the end. So the essential good news that uh, God has for us in the scriptures can be summarized in one verse. If we go to uh, the Gospel of John, we find these words. John 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We've found out really this year, haven't we, that a lot of people have become very scared very quickly and we've seen some bizarre kind of panicky behavior at times in society uh, from a lot of people because this situation that COVID has brought upon the whole world has suddenly uh, hit us without any sort of preparation or much of a warning. And it's really spooked certain people and it's because essentially they're scared of catching a virus because they think it might might kill them and it can you know there are plenty of cases that we've read about i'm sure where perfectly healthy young people and old people have uh, had no underlying conditions and become ill and and sadly have, have have died but the good news of the bible message if we would only accept it and believe it is that the lord jesus christ when he gave up his life as a sacrifice 
in obedience to his father's will, he made it possible for us sinners to find forgiveness and be blessed by God and by his grace, be given eternal life, everlasting life, as that 16th verse says. And this is what the Bible calls the hope of salvation. That's what Chris Duffins believe and have been talking about uh, for many, many, many years. And it's all there contained in the scriptures. We haven't got enough time tonight to go through uh, all the scriptures that talk about this, but I would encourage you in your own time to, to really look into this. Now, as I said previously, the news of the world, where are we right now? Well, we've seen a lot of antagonism this year between uh, America and China. We've seen a real recalibration of international relations between certain nations. We've seen some nations clustering together and some nations, uh, for example, in the EU, where things are, are coming apart. As we know, Britain has now left the European Union. There's um, great changes going on in the, in the governments of the world. And the Lord Jesus spoke about this when he prophesied these words in Matthew chapter 24, where he said, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places all these are the beginnings of sorrows now those three words there famines pestilences and earthquakes um, we've seen those this year i'll go on to talk a little bit about that a little later but ultimately as i've said i want this to be a good news talk so daniel chapter 2 again in the old testament uh, again talks about this coming permanent global kingdom of God where the Lord Jesus will reign in peace and righteousness so if we look at Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44 it says and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever we'll look at that in a bit more detail shortly so then we're going to take a lesson from history. Let's go back to the time of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Now, back in the day, this was the global superpower on the planet. As you can see on the slide there, it covered a vast territory in the Middle East. So we're looking at uh, Israel and Lebanon and Syria and uh, parts of uh, modern day Iraq. And, and all that region you can see identified there was all under the control of this man, Nebuchadnezzar II. He was almighty and all-powerful over this territory. He had a vast army, vast wealth, and he uh, was the longest reigning and the most powerful monarchs of that, of that time. He went to bed every night safe and secure that he was in a position of great strength and that there was nobody coming to uh, threaten him in any way. <clears throat> However, one night he uh, goes to sleep and he has this terrifying vision, a terrifying dream at night. And unusually for this king, he uh, wakes up absolutely beside himself in the morning, terrified. He's had this dream, this vision, this picture in his mind. He can't remember what it is. He doesn't know what it was, but he knows that he's absolutely terrified. And so he's desperate to find out what it is that's happened. So what does he do? <clears throat> in uh, Daniel chapter 2, we have the record. So it's the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, he dreamed dreams and his spirit was troubled. His sleep break from him. And then the king commanded to the magicians and to the astrologers and to the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king and the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. This is what world leaders do when they have a major problem, don't they? They go and talk to the experts, don't they? They go and talk to the courtiers and the people in positions of knowledge and authority in the establishment who they need to go to, to to get some answers. Well, unfortunately, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, despite consulting with the great and the good of the land of his time, gets no answers and is furious. However, there was at the time the Jewish prophet Daniel living in captivity in uh, his kingdom. And if we go to the verse uh, 16, it says that Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, 
Blessed be the name of God for ever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. So in his fury, King Nebuchadnezzar is about to destroy all of these uh, courtiers and experts and soothsayers who weren't able to give him no answers. But Daniel, in faith, prays to God and God reveals these secrets to him. He then goes and speaks to the king. Well, he explains in Daniel chapter two, if, we, if we're wise, we'll look at it in our own time. The king has this terrifying vision of this image that stands up. And this image is represented in type here on the screen. I mean, we're not entirely sure whether the arms were folded or outstretched. It doesn't really matter, I suppose. But, but this is the image that the king saw, which terrified him so greatly. And the image is of a man with the he a head of gold, with a chest and arms of silver, with a belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and feet of part iron and part clay. So there's these five uh, elements, these five metals. As you go down the image, the metals get cheaper, but they get stronger. And we get to the fifth, and there is no sixth. Now, this image that was being shown to Nebuchadnezzar is an image from God. It's kind of like a political cartoon in a way, but it has great meaning and significance. It shows uh, world leaders and empires throughout human history, culminating in the time at the end of these feet and these toes. So um, Daniel explains this image to the king and then explains to him what happens afterwards in the image, because the next event was this. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44 says, in the days of these kings, referring there to the, the feet, the, the clay and the iron, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone, verse 45 now, was cut out of the mountain without hands and it break in pieces, the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure. So Daniel explains in this chapter that Nebuchadnezzar was represented by this head of gold. Then after him, his territory and kingdom would fall to another kingdom, which would then fall to another kingdom. It would go down and down and down through human history. But ultimately a little stone comes out of heaven itself and smashes into this image and grinds it all to powder then expands and takes over. And this is an image talking about the coming kingdom of God on earth, this eternal everlasting kingdom, which will soon be set up. Now I want you to also from the book of Daniel look at a, a verse which gives us a, a, a really important fundamental principle to do with world leaders as far as God is concerned because Daniel also explains in verse uh, 17 of chapter 4 this, this is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basest of men. So this verse is telling us that actually, you may think you vote for world leaders. Uh, you may think that world leaders come to power through human methods. Well, it might look like that way, but in actual fact, it's God who puts certain individuals into power and then takes them out of power. Uh, he puts sometimes some of the worst people possible into the greatest positions of political power in the world. I mean, if you look at America right now and the man who's in charge of that nation, if you look at Russia right now, the man who's in charge of that nation, if you look at other territories around the world and the type of leaders that there are, I'm sure you would agree that some of them are the basest or the lowest, the worst kinds of men to hold these uh, political powers. But ultimately, the, as Bible students who understand prophecy a little bit, understand that God is actually behind the scenes. He's gradually, bit by bit, taking his time throughout the centuries, building and going according to his plan, setting up ready 
for the kingdom of God on earth. Okay, let's go to the New Testament now and find out a little more about this uh, kingdom of God because it's specific to the Lord Jesus. We saw a couple of references there from Daniel and Isaiah about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we saw how the Lord Jesus in his uh, first advent when he was here on the earth some 2000 years ago, preaching and teaching about the coming kingdom of God. Uh, we saw then that his, his work then was to preach and teach. Uh, the Bible also talks about how he, will, how he will return again, and then he will return with a different role. He will rule the world as king. Now, words were spoken about him uh, before his birth. So if we look at uh, Luke in chapter one, the Lord God sent an angel to speak to the Lord Jesus's mother, Mary. Verse 30 says of Luke chapter one, the angel said unto her, fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and he shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. So these words of the angel here to Mary were prophetic. Some of these words have come true. Some of these words are still yet to come true. So yes, Mary did have a son. Yes, he was called Jesus. He was great. He was the son of God. And the Lord Jesus will give to him when he returns the throne of his forefather, David, and he will rule over this kingdom forever. So these words in Luke chapter one are partly fulfilled, but not completely fulfilled. And there are other scriptures which uh, tell us more detail about this. And again, we saw in Isaiah earlier on how uh, in chapter nine, this reference in the Old Testament, as we have here also in the new, in verse seven, of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. So in God's kingdom, when the Lord Jesus Christ sits on his throne and rules the world from Jerusalem, warfare will be a thing of the past. Uh, we look in uh, the Old Testament and we have prophecies uh, in Zechariah and Zephaniah, words such as they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. You know, there's, there's going to be a transformation. Instead of governments having their primary expenditure on things like defense, they're instead going to use it to feed people instead. They're going to invest it in agricultural meth methods instead. So the whole world is going to be completely transformed and changed from the way it is today to the way it will be when God wants it, when the Lord Jesus returns. Okay, well, if we go into Luke chapter 21 again, the Lord Jesus himself made some very specific promises about what would be going on in the world just before he returns back to planet Earth again. Uh, the signs of the times, if you like. And he was uh, with his disciples on the Mount of Olives one day, and they came to him, and as verse 3 says, they came unto him privately and said, tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And then if we read the, the entire chapter in Luke uh, chapter 21, by the time we get to verse 11, Jesus says this, three things, three characteristics of What's going, what the world's going to be like just before he returns. He said there will be great earthquakes in diverse places and famines and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. OK, so let's look at those. Well, in recent years, we've seen different types of earthquakes. There have always been actual literal earthquakes throughout the years. In recent years, there's been an increase in larger earthquakes. I mean, if you cast your mind back a few years ago, we had in Japan an earthquake uh, out to sea, which caused a dreadful and terrible tsunami. Uh, there was the Boxing Day uh, tsunami in um, 2004, I think it was. So we, we know we're all about big earthquakes, but we have lots of little ones. I mean, Britain actually is, is quite seismically active. When you look at the, the, uh, the way in which the original language is recorded in Luke, the original Greek word here for earthquake is the word seismos, where we get seismic from in our, in our understanding of earthquakes and the way in which tectonic plates work. So Jesus isn't talking just about literal earthquakes. Jesus is actually talking about political earthquakes. And we've had some world-shaking, shocking 
uh, earthquakes, politically speaking, happening in recent times. Now, of course, on the screen there, you've got a couple of press articles covering what happened back in 2016, when uh, the, the establishment thinking and, the, and you know, the majority of world opinion thinking was that Britain would never be as mad as to, to leave the European Union. And then what happened? The British voted to leave the European Union. It was an absolute earthquake. The whole post-war idea of nations in Europe all teaming up and working together was shattered in many ways. So that's one kind of earthquake that we've seen recently. And of course, another kind of earthquake was the impossibility of President Trump being elected. It was impossible that he would run as a candidate. It was impossible that the Republican Party would endorse him. It was impossible that he was going to go up in the polls. And then it was impossible that the, the nation would vote for him. But the nation of America did vote for him. It was an absolute shock. This man who came from the world of business and from television, um, with no political experience, no military experience, not a politician, was elected to be, as they say, the leader of the free world. And since he's been in office over the last four years, there's been massive changes to the way uh, nations operate with each other and how NATO works and relations with the Chinese and the relations with Russia and things in the Middle East happening. So it's been a real shock to the normal political processes that we're familiar with in recent years. Jesus also, also talked about famines. Now, the, uh, the, the COVID problem at the moment has also had a knock-on effect in terms of uh, global hunger. There was a statement really by a chap called David Beasley, a UN World F a Food Programme Director, and he said, uh, forgive me for speaking bluntly, but I'd like to lay it out for you very clearly what the world is facing at the moment. At the same time, while dealing with COVID-19 pandemic, we're also on the brink of a hunger pandemic. There are vast numbers of people in the world who are struggling for food for various different reasons, COVID being one of many. So this is a, a famine problem and it's partly caused by pestilences. So this year there have been some devastating locust swarms in India uh, where it was described as the worst for 27 years. Uh, this was back in May and uh, the UN warned about in Africa as well, Ethiopia, Kenya and so forth, as you can see, um, you know, tons and tons of essential food for the peoples of these countries, devastated and wiped out by unusually large, uh, unusually large pestilences of locusts. It, it doesn't really affect us over here in, in, in the West, does it, that much, but for so many people in so many other parts of the world, this is a dreadful, dreadful problem. But this is one of the characteristics of the times in which we live, which Jesus accurately foretold. Now, in uh, the Old Testament again, if we go back into Ezekiel 38, we have uh, a remarkable prophecy. We have here um, something which is uh, described in great detail for us in chapter 38. And it's all to do with the nations of the world all coming together in a military confederacy to uh, invade Israel. And I want you to look as we look at this, um, at the, at the nations which are actually joining together. So Ezekiel chapter 38, verse two says this, son of man set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief priests of Meshach and, uh, Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armour, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, Persia, Ethiopia and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Now some of the names of some of the nations and territories referred to in Ezekiel chapter 38 here, some of these names of been lost in the mists of time and have changed time and time again. But some of them are still with us today and have survived from their ancient times. So we still know where Libya is on North Africa. It's been called Libya for a very long time. Ethiopia too. Persia, um, I remember years ago that the Shah of Persia being dispo uh, deposed when in about 1979, the Iranian revolution took over. So we're familiar with Persia identifying the territory we call Iran. So some of these nations are part of this military confederacy, but we need to look and understand and identify who is 
Gog the Prince uh, of Meshach and Tubal from the land of Magog. Well, you can see there on the screen a map which identifies these ancient names for these territories, which today we call uh, Russia. So the word Meshek there, for example, was a, a name that was associated with tribes of peoples who lived up in the north. That word changed over the years and developed and became Moscow. Uh, there's a river, uh, Tobolsk, uh, in Russia. Uh, that word has, has changed over the years from its original Tubal. But notice how in verse four it says, I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws and bring thee forth with this military confederacy. It's interesting how a whole range of things have influenced and affected Russia. Russia, like all of the nations, is battling with COVID-19. But recently, in, in, in recent years, we, we recall how that Russia was shut out of the world's financial markets and had great sanctions placed upon it in 2014 when it invaded the Ukraine. Russia financially is in a real mess. Um, there are effectively two states in Russia. There's a there's the, the, the standard state and there's a corrupt state where you know state officials make a lot of money on the side and a lot of money flowed out of Russia uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1989-1990. A lot of money was funneled out of the country by the KGB and stashed in various places so that after the, uh, the, the, the Soviet uh, system collapsed, whatever came back afterwards, the KGB would be able to have some money to influence and try and control. A lot of that money wound up being invested in the pockets of a certain uh, New York property developer, but that's another story for another time. And uh, so there's, there's this real problem with, with Russia today. It's losing a lot of money because of the collapse in demand from business for its exports, such as uh, natural gas to the European energy markets for industry. Uh, people aren't uh, flying around anymore. There's less demand for global travel. There's less demand for manufacturing. Certain sectors of the economy are in real trouble. And uh, people aren't, you know, in Britain, for example, when COVID broke out, you know, traffic levels fell to the lowest since the early 1950s. There's been an unprecedented fall in demand for a whole host of products in the economy. And this is a major problem for Russia because it vitally depends on its exports of natural gas, uh, oil, and other similar uh, products. So Russia is losing money really badly at the moment. And if it doesn't uh, do something quickly, it's gonna be in real trouble. It's been re running basically on its savings uh, that it made in the good years in the 90s when it was making a lot of money for a barrel of oil. But again, the price of that has, has, has fallen so much recently. Russia is under real, real financial pressure. And if Mr. Putin can't fix this, then he's going to be in trouble in terms of securing his um, pr premiership over Russia. So he's got a real problem. So Gog, as we've seen, uh, the word means uh, mountain. Uh, something which is higher than uh, above, you know, in, in political terms, something which is above is a mountain, isn't it? So it's somebody at the top. Uh, that's what Ezekiel 38 is talking about. It also uses the word uh, chief, uh, Rosh, to identify um, uh, Rus or Russia. Um, and um, he's, he's, he's called a prince in Ezekiel 38 as well, isn't he? And interesting how uh, the word Vladimir uh, is Slavic, meaning... Uh, from its original uh, in Russian, meaning renowned prince. So it's talking about a man who's the leader of these peoples of the north, uh, Russia, as we call it today. He's going to be brought down. Now, it could be Mr. Putin, it could be his successor, we don't know. But whoever it is, is going to find themselves in a few years' time under real financial pressure, and they're going to have a hook in their jaw. They're going to be forced down against their will into the land of Israel. So... Zechariah in chapter 14 talks about what will happen to Israel and specifically to Jerusalem. Now, uh, Israel today in the middle of the Middle East, the only democracy surrounded by Arab nations around it, um, is, is always a center of international political controversy. There's been arguments for decades now about what to do about the peace process and the two-state solution and things like that. Um, but Zechariah talks about some dreadful events uh, which are going to happen in the future. But also it talks about how that when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, he will come to deliver 
Jerusalem, the Jews and Israel from uh, their captivity. So if we look at um, chapter 14 of Zechariah, it says this. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city shall be taken and the houses rifled and the women ravished and half the city shall go forth into captivity and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Well, we saw in the last century uh, what dreadful things were done to the Jews. And some people talk about the Holocaust as if it was a one-off event. And the suffering that the Jewish people had, the awfulness of it, how could this ever possibly happen again? Well, sadly, the Bible talks about how Israel is going to suffer again and they're going to be invaded and Jerusalem is going to go into captivity. But verse three goes and tells us what will happen after that. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley and half of the mountain shall remove to the north and half of it toward the south. Notice how Zechariah is talking about his feet standing on the Mount of Olives. When the Lord Jesus left the earth, he ascended from the Mount of Olives. And when he returns, Zechariah says he will return and his feet will come back to stand on the Mount of Olives in the same place from where he left. He will come back to deliver Israel, the Jews, Jerusalem from this great and dreadful captivity that they are going to suffer. And it's interesting how we saw in um, uh, Ezekiel chapter 38, how this phrase hooks in thy jaws was used. Well, uh, this invasion of Israel, which is going to happen in a few years time, we don't know when exactly, the Bible doesn't tell us, but uh, Ezekiel makes it very clear that these hooks will be placed in these jaws and pull these nations down. So um, in ancient times, when you as a king invaded another kingdom and took over its territory, you captured the king of the territory you invaded and to to show your power over them not only were they bound in fetters of brass for example in 2 kings 57 uh the the, the the sons of zedekiah the king their eyes were put out and they were carried off to babylon so this brutal cruelness was done in ancient times to kings whose territories were overtaken and uh this imagery this language of putting a hook in the jaw or putting the eyes out just in, illustrates the brutality involved in one kingdom taking over another. If you have a hook in the jaw of somebody, whichever way you pull, they go the way you want them to go. And so, so God is saying in Ezekiel 38, he is in control of uh, these northern peoples in Russia. He's going to pull them down. They don't want to go, but he's going to pull them down and they're going to go and invade Israel. It's all part of his plan. Now think about what it was like at the start of the year for Mr Putin. He had a good year coming up, didn't he? He was going to uh, rewrite the constitution, he got the government to resign, and he was going to ensure that he was going to be in office, in power, for as long as he wanted, basically. So this was January, he was all happy and confident. By the time we got to May, all of his plans were in tatters. There was the Covid crisis, there was the collapse in demand for his exports and the money that was going uh, out of the country wasn't worth what it was and the economy was nose diving and he was in a real problem he couldn't do what he wanted to do and uh, we have to be very skeptical about the figures that come out of countries like uh, china and russia but there was a very interesting article on the bbc uh, website not long, not long ago about how uh, mr putin himself dodged a bullet with regard to covid he went to a hospital and visited and uh, had a little walk around and there he is there being led around by a doctor who then tested positive not long after the visit and then uh, mr putin was suddenly uh, hiding away in his dasher and uh, under very close uh, observation and uh, it was a, a real worry to him he had a, a, a close scrape and uh, there was a, an analyst at chatham house chatham house the think tank called uh, nikolai petrov who said this i think for the first time in his active political life 
Putin is faced by a problem which is absolutely not under his control and which broke all his plans. So here we have another episode of a world leader who normally likes to have his way, normally gets his way, but now he's got a problem that he can't deal with. And in Russia, if you can't control something, by definition, it's a threat. So this has been a real source of concern for Mr. Putin and for Russia. So we, uh, interesting, isn't it? I mean, over here in Britain, um, if you have COVID, there's three symptoms. You have a fever, you have loss of taste and smell, and uh, there's another one that escapes me at the top of my head. But uh, in Russia, if you have COVID, you mysteriously fall out of windows and die. So there's been these cases in Russia where um, doctors have been complaining about the lack of PPE in hospitals and they've been under pressure to record deaths as one reason and not another reason. And uh, there's been pressure to ma manipulate the figures for COVID infection rates and death rates. And uh, things have been very, very unusual. And uh, when Mr. Putin wants things recorded in one way, then normally that's the way things go. But uh, he's been caught mid-step. Uh, this analyst Petrov has, goes on further to say this article, which I recommend you read in your own time. Putin's eager to finish his plans. It's like he was caught mid-jump over a fence. It's not a very comfortable position for him to be in. And uh, Mr. Putin, 2019, uh, one of the uh, most glorious days in the Russian calendar, as, uh, as far as the Russians are concerned, is the Victory Day Parade, where they celebrate their victory um, over the, uh, the, the Nazis in uh, World War II. So that was a picture from 2019. But thanks to COVID, 2020 was a much more scaled back affair. And think of the psychological impact on Mr. Putin um, when he sees this much greatly reduced um, spectacle, celebration of all that's Russian and good. Uh, in front of him. It would have had a, a, a great significance on him. This is, of course, the man who, in his State of the Union speech way back in 2005, not only talks about the collapse of the uh, uh, Soviet Union as, as a dreadful thing, as far as he's concerned, it was the worst thing that ever happened in the 20th century. He said that it was the, the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. As far as he's concerned, it was worse than World War II. This is the mind, this gives you an insight in, into the thinking of this man. It's very different to the way other people think around the world. Quite astonishing, this mindset of this man. So as we've seen this year, as the Financial Times reported recently, uh, Russia's got these real problems with falling oil prices and it's uh, really ruining uh, Putin's plans to spend what he wants to spend on Russia. Um, when the outbreak of coronavirus uh, broke out, the international oil benchmark went down 10% to $50 a barrel. Um, Russia's break even point was $42 a barrel. This was causing a real fall in living standards for people in Russia and put pressure on the leadership of Russia um, and, and you know, undermines their stability and, and long term future. So Russia is under real financial pressure. We actually saw, again this year, uh, for the first time ever, the price of US oil turning negative. Um, they were paying you to take the oil off them. We saw um, shipping containers off the coast in America full of oil with nowhere to dock because the refineries didn't want to take the oil in to process it into products because there was just no demand for it. So we've had real uh, shock waves rippling through the global oil markets and, and this has been a, a, a unique uh, historic event this year you can see the, the price fluctuation there and how it goes under the zero value on that chart there that's put out by the BBC so COVID has really shaken the world up it's having uh, a detrimental effect on world relations there was literally a shouting match between the Saudis and the Russians a few months ago at the start of all this crisis and uh, the Russians wanted uh, oil production to flow and the Saudis wanted to make changes to it. And they were literally shouting at each other over the phone and uh, it was not good. And uh, I've got a little um, um, graph for you there just to give you an indication of uh, the Russian economy and its exports and how you can see there how 35%, a great chunk is dependent on crude oil and gas 
and there's another chunk there which is on refined oil products so a huge chunk of the russian economy is dependent on its petrochemical uh, exports and this is under real pressure at the moment with global demand well we've uh, seen in ezekiel chapter 38 about how uh, israel is going to be invaded verse 8 it specifies there that after many days Thou shalt be visited in the latter years. Thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste. But it is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely all of them. So why Israel? Why is it that Russia is going to invade Israel? Why does Zechariah as well talk about how Jerusalem will be the city out of all the cities in the world where all nations are going to go to um, battle. Well, Mr. Netanyahu, the uh, Prime Minister of Israel, has a very controversial plan to implement Israeli sovereignty, uh, sovereignty over um, what is called the West Bank. Um, the West Bank is a name that's put on to uh, these territories in Israel, which are supposed to be for the Palestinian people. The Palestinian question is uh, one of great concern to all the nations of the world. And uh, they've been trying to solve this peace process uh, for many decades. And Mr. Netanyahu is a very hard line uh, man who personally thinks that he's the only man who can save and protect the Jewish people and Israel. He's got this controversial plan that he wants to implement uh, over uh, the West Bank and make it more uh, like Israel and then put his sovereignty over these territories. And these territories are disputed by other nations according to international law. But Mr. Netanyahu isn't really bothered about international law. He's going to, he wants, he has his plan to go forward and, and make uh, the West Bank territories sovereign. And uh, the European Union aren't very happy about this. This is a controversy on uh, the European Union's part as well. They're very much behind the idea of a two-state solution. They're not happy about what uh, the Israeli government plan to do with these territories in uh, the West Bank. So this is a source of controversy. Uh, French have been uh, pushing for a for new response to uh, any Israeli annexation move. So uh, the, the two big engines of the European Union are France and Germany. So uh, whatever Mr. Macron says or Ms. Merkel says, you have to pay attention to because they really drive what the European nations are going to do. Now, Ezekiel 38 talks about territories, uh, Goma and so forth, territories which today we call um you know, parts of the european union and uh, they're going to ally with russia when they come down and invade israel in a few years time again the russians have uh, outlined very clearly they're not happy about israeli annexation calling it an ex escalation uh, their foreign minister sergey lavrov said that such expansionist moves by israel may provoke a dangerous wave of violence across the palestinian territories and destabilize the middle east as a whole now, it's interesting how just to the north of Israel, we have Syria and Russian troops have been in Syria for a few years, a few years now, propping up the Assad regime. Um, the Russians have supplied the very latest um, S-300 and S-400 missiles to the border uh, of Syria, uh, right on the Golan Heights to Israel's north. And occasionally Israel over the last few years have done the odd raid over the border into uh, Lebanon and specifically Syria to attack uh, Hezbollah uh, infrastructure. Uh, but uh, when Mr. Putin finds out about these kind of raids, he expresses his displeasure and uh, tells the Israelis to stop such activities. And uh, they often comply. So there's tension between Russia uh, on Israel's northern border. So as we've seen again, um, Another reason why Israel is potentially a, an attractive uh, target for Russia is because Israel in recent years have found vast quantities of natural gas in some fields just off their border in the East Mediterranean. And this again is a, a great threat to uh, Russia's supply networks into the European gas market. It does not want to see any competitors biting into its territory which it, it, it views as its own so any pipelines that are now coming on stream bringing uh, natural gas onshore into the european market and undercutting russian products this is not acceptable as far as mr putin is concerned 
And uh, as that title there says from a, a trade magazine, uh, Russia is not willing to reduce its share of the European gas market. Um, again, we've seen price fluctuations this year with, with uh, the price of natural gas. You can see it had a high there back in November, but it's uh, in May of this year um, come down quite significantly in price. So this is a real economic pressure point on um, Russia. If Israel wanted to, and it kept all of the uh, natural gas for itself, it could be energy independent for a hundred years. There are literally trillions of dollars worth of natural gas now under its feet, as it were, and it's now harvesting them and bringing them onshore and, and using them to uh, make a lot of money and, and be a competitor against Russia. And this is politically not acceptable as far as Mr. Putin is concerned. Well, elsewhere in Ezekiel 38, we saw about how Libya was a nation that confederated with Russia when it invades Israel. And um, on Twitter recently, uh, I mean, if you want to know what the news is before the news does, uh, then have a look on the internet, have a look on Twitter, because recently this, this year, um, uh, the, the American um, Africa commander said that Russian jets in Libya present broader worries for the region. Um, when uh, Gaddafi fell in Libya, went into a kind of long-term civil war, um, lots of fighters flooded into the region, lots of weaponry flooded into the region off the black market from here, there and everywhere. But now, class four Russian fighters are actively engaged in combat in Libya, and these can only be maintained as airworthy fighting vehicles, uh, aircraft I should say, with state support. So uh, the Russians have been backing uh, this man here, General Hifter. Um, he's uh, the man who the Russians have been arming. Uh, he's the man they're backing. He's the man who they are using to gain influence and control in Libya. And uh, it's because it's fulfilling the prophecy that uh, Ezekiel chapter 38 talks about. So the Americans have been very concerned about this. Uh, a general Townsend said recently, for too long, Russia had denied the full extent of its involvement in the ongoing Libyan conflict. Well, there's no denying it now. They released these spy shots of uh, Russian fighters on the ground and in the air, militarily active in Libya. More information of that there. Again, it's all online for you to read it uh, in your own time. And uh, interestingly, we've seen most recently um, behind the scenes, Mr. Trump um, doing deals with more moderate Middle Eastern nations to make them um, normalize relations with Israel. Again, this has been a fascinating development. So there's been this uh, normalization of relations between uh, Israel and the UAE and Bahrain. Deals have been signed. There's been a ceremony took place in Washington. Um, with the Saudis, it's a bit more complicated than that. So I was reading today that the king of Saudi Arabia doesn't want to do a, a normalization deal with Israel because he wants to stick to the Arab framework, which was agreed uh, to do with the security of a Palestinian state. However, the number two, uh, Prince Salman, uh, he does want to do a peace deal. Uh, recently, I think in the last week or so, it's been announced that the Saudis are now giving permission for flights to take place between Israel and uh, the UAE and Bahrain over Saudi airspace. So there is this softening of relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Tacitly behind the scenes, they see that Israel is a, a country they can do business with and also a country that they can use to help protect them from the threat of Iran. The real concern in the region from Saudi Arabia's point of view is what Iran is doing. And if you look at that map there, you can see the, the, uh, the distribution of Sunni Muslims uh, against Shia Muslims in uh, the Middle East. Iran is run by a, a very radical hardline Shia faction uh, of, of Islam. And uh, whereas much of the Middle East is uh, much more uh, Sunni based and a bit more moderate. So there's this, there's this split in the Middle East. And uh, it's interesting how right now these deals, Mr. Trump, is uh, negotiating with Israel and with these moderate Middle Eastern nations. And people are saying, well, there's other nations next as well. Uh, Mr. Trump's very keen on these peace deals and trade and normalization of relations and the opening of embassies, that sort of thing. Uh, Mr. Biden isn't so keen on such things. He's very concerned about uh, 
uh, what this means for the Palestinians and the peace process and so forth. But with the election coming up again in November, it's going to be interesting because way back in Genesis chapter 12, God said when speaking to Abraham and speaking of his children, the Jews, that I will bless them that blessed thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. History shows us really that those countries, those nations who are friendly and good to Israel, they do well. God blesses them and they do well. So maybe this will be something which guarantees that Mr. Trump, again, horror of horrors to so many, will be re-elected as president for another four years come November of this year. We shall see. And otherwise, what else have we seen in the world? Well, the world is changing in so many ways and fragmenting in, in many ways. I mean, over the weekend, we've seen protests. Uh, there's been protests in, in Birmingham. There's been protests in Nottingham. There's been protests in many towns and cities across uh, Britain in response to the, uh, this Black Lives Matter movement from America. And it's interesting how the police have responded uh, to the protests over the last week or so as people protest about lockdown and having to wear masks and... Uh, they're concerned about a whole bunch of things and in, in, in the way in which COVID is used to restrict or maybe even remove uh, traditional British liberties and things. And uh, it's been interesting to see these images on our screens in recent days. The world is really rocking and reeling and the, the governments of the world really are not in control, are they? You have to admit that the forces of nature and the forces of creation, the forces of God, are really shaking the world at the moment. And it's, it's leading to some great changes that uh, we're all having to adapt and cope with. But one final thought before we run our, uh, run our uh, thoughts to a conclusion. There was a couple of episodes in, in scripture where before God's judgments fell on uh, cities or on peoples, certain of the faithful were put into lockdown. Now, interestingly, in uh, Genesis chapter seven, when we have the record of the flood, the global flood that God caused upon the whole earth to remove all the, the wicked people from this earth, he saved just eight, Noah and his family. But Noah basically went into lockdown before the judgments of God fell upon the earth. If you look at chapter seven of verse five of chapter seven of Genesis, Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him, Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in to the ark and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean and of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. And they went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days the waters of the flood were upon the earth. So Noah was in lockdown in the ark with all these animals, with his wife, with his sons and their wives. He was there isolated, temporarily sheltered away before the judgments of God fell. If we go into Joshua, when the people of Israel uh, took the city of Jericho, there was a woman there called Rahab. And uh, she was a, a citizen of Jericho at the time, but she'd heard about the Jews. She believed that it was only God who could have protected the Jews and given them their victories. And she was concerned about uh, what was going to happen to Jericho. And she put her trust in God and she made an agreement with the, the spies who'd gone into the land. And uh, there was an agreement made. And if we look at verse 18 of Joshua 6, behold, the Jews said to her, when we come into the land, Thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window which thou didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head. So they said to Rahab, you and your family go into lockdown in your house. You stay there. You stay in that house. If you go out, tough. But if you stay in the house, you will be delivered. And that's exactly what happened. She was delivered, the city fell, the walls fell in, but Rahab, because of her faith in God, was delivered and saved. That's an interesting thing. We have been in lockdown earlier this year during the Jewish feast of Passover, a very significant time in Jewish life, a very interesting time that the whole world, us, have, have been in lockdown. And we're about to see, I think, the judgments of God out again. 
So we live in momentous times, my friends. And if you are wise, you are going to read the scriptures and find out about how you can be part of this glorious future. Because as Isaiah says, it shall come to pass in the last days that the mount of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. Verse four says, he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. This world, as we know it and understand it, is going to end. But a new world is going to be constructed here. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming back to the earth soon, as the Bible prophesied. He will rule over the whole world as king. And those who believe in him and trust in him can have everlasting life and a place in that glorious future. If you are wise, you will read about the Bible and what it has to say and believe in it, because God will have his way. So it is good news, friends. The wickedness and crime and evil that we have in this world is all going to be swept away when the Lord Jesus returns. And I would encourage you to read your scriptures and find out about the good news of the Bible message. Thank you.